Hello and welcome to the Real Life History Podcast, a podcast where the four of us today discuss history for a bit of an hour. Today's episode is about the gemification, uh, but first we shall begin with a short news segment of things that happened over the last week or so. Go on, Peter. Um, so we're going to start off by talking regarding the Algerian protests. Uh, both the news that the current president is going to run for a fifth term. Now, the president has been in power for over 20 years, and after suffering a stroke in 2013, he's been confined to a wheelchair and very rarely makes public appearances. He needed help casting his vote, and right now, a lot of people really doesn't want him to run again, because first off, they're very confused about what this pre- president actually d- does, considering he is so sick and weak. Um, currently, he is receiving medical treatment in Switzerland. Also, secondly, a lot of people are accusing the president of being an authoritarian leader, as, you know, he's been in power for over 20 years. Um, however, a lot of Algeria is supposed to be that if the president has been removed, um, there would be no clear successor, and the country would be plunged into political instability and chaos. Yeah, I, I think... It, it, it's, so, it's so weird for me, because, like, he, he... I don't understand why he's wrong. He he said he's gonna step down right halfway like or he's not even gonna serve the full term so it's like why the hell is he actually even doing it in the first place if he doesn't plan to run for the whole time clearly he's not fit to be president exactly. and but he's still in power he's he, he he yeah, yeah, like, he, yeah he, he's the fact that he's just still in power just shows that he doesn't actually want to let go it's gonna be another instant like well, most authoritarian dictatorships end up as Mm. Mm. But does he really have a concrete successor? I mean, he has like... I don't think so. I, I think, as you see in a lot of these cases, there's a large opposition to remove someone, but the opposition can't agree on to who's to succeed. That is like, that is a repeating case over and over and over again in terms of these sort of like authoritarian, quote unquote. He's not, you know, I think he has technically been re-elected, I'm not sure. Well, but, I mean, know, you know, it's like elections, but... Who knows? Uh, the the emergency rule in 2011 after regional unrest, and now you know there's more people demanding that he resign or not run for a fifth term due to authoritarian tendencies. I saw he tweeted, maybe it was a tweet, maybe it was something else, but he said that um, he was like he was happy that people were um, or he said that the protests he was glad that they were um, yeah he said he also praised the demonstrations for peacefully expressing their opinions. But it's like. He doesn't, but I mean, two hundred like a day. On the other hand, yeah, that's that's very true. But not everyone's peaceful, so yeah, no, that's true. But the fact that he acknowledges that some people are, it's like mm, he doesn't seem too authoritarian if he makes a comment like that. But I don't know. I think it's hard for us to tell considering we don't live in that Algeria and we don't get that much information on it. Yeah, so we're making a, a, a judgment based off the very thin top. Yeah, we just get from what we get from the news. Yeah, essentially. But um, it should be quite interesting because it looks like the movement's getting a lot bigger, and, which will it will be very interesting to see actually if he does so end up serving another term. Or not. I mean, this also good chance he's going to die in office, which that's going to really screw some things up. Yeah, considering how sick he appears to be, because he's gone to the UK to get medical treatment, and now he's in Switzerland. And he's just not in, he's not showing in public anymore. It's like he's like crippled into a wheelchair. I don't know. It seems good. Mm-hmm. Um, for, for the next story, we're going to talk about the, uh, the Venezuelan power cuts. Um, ever since around last Thursday, um, there's been major problems at a hydroelectric plant, which has cut off almost the power for um, almost all of Venezuela. Although some regions, some regions have their power restored, um, there are still a lot of problems regarding access to um, electricity. For example, the hospitals find themselves really, really difficult to work in a condition where they aren't just any electricity to direct people. And people were obviously forced to use um, mobile phones to direct themselves to see without the um, power. There's been, there, there has been a steady decline in the quality of Venezuela power support. Um, in 2016, the power, the power shortages got to a point where um, the government had to declare a 60-day state of emergency. Um, and of course, with the current um, political crisis going on in Venezuela, things are going to get riled up regarding more protests as Maduro is being challenged 
and now there's this huge blackout that's affecting the lives of many, many people living there. I wonder if Majira was the cause of it. I wonder if the opposition was actually the cause of it, because it seems like that would be something that would work in their favor. You know what I mean? Yeah. Possibly. Yeah, but... but actually, I just, I, saw this, I just saw this article, right, which... Um, mm-hmm. Which looks actually quite interesting. It says, "Is there a new cult of personality in Venezuela around Guaido?" Which is actually sort of interesting because, like, he's extremely popular. I don't yeah. know. I, I sort of looked at that. It's like it seems kind of weird. I don't. I don't think so. I think that might just be like a <laughs> news fishing for like clicks. But it's sort of an interesting question because he has like a huge amount of popularity. Yeah, he's got a seventy-five percent popular. Yeah. Right? And he's got like a really strong following with some people, and I yeah. don't know for for him backing as well. He definitely he. I can see why he's got it though. They had they had they had Maduro. We don't really know. We don't really know if he's a good president or not. If he's actually good for the country, all we know is that he's a difference. And like you see many times in the past, with like for example, even the Russian Civil War, people look for a difference. They look for communism in the Soviet Union. Right? It's like people are just looking for. A Different sort of gravitate person, but is he actually good for the country? Like, we don't know. No, he, he's we relative. He was like basically a nobody up until 28 yeah. years. He just got catapulted into the um, the center stage for politics because he decided to oppose the euro. It honestly, like, I, I question his motives. Like, one one reason, fair enough. Maybe if I'm I'm not a cynic. <laughs> maybe he could actually just be trying to. You know, improve the lives of his people, which is fair enough. People do do that. But then again, in countries like Venezuela and those sort of like those, you know, developing nations, usually the case isn't that. Usually the case is someone will take up a noble cause in order to just transfer the power to them. But I don't know. He does seem like a decent person, but yeah, but you can never be sure. I yeah, mean, exactly. Look at what happened with him, Chavez. He did the I'm same thing. Yeah, I'm actually quite skeptical over that. Like, I don't know. It's... Mm. Mm. Interesting. Well, people like Maduro just sort of naturally attract opposition as time goes on. The situation deteriorates. That's true. When he, when he doesn't have a certain thing, but then the question remains that if, if we're going to make this, people are going to have to make this choice, would the new choice be better? Or would it just be the, 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 the lesser of the two evils? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So for the um for the um the last article um or or event we're gonna talk about the um the the Hanoi conference between Kim Jong Un and Donald Trump um as we've already know there were issues regarding some terms involving denuclearization and um the lifting of sanctions which caused the summit to collapse, basically nothing was agreed on, and the two leaders just left. However, with new satellite imagery, it looks like that the North Koreans are reconstructing one of their missile or satellite sites, and could possibly be preparing for another launch. Yeah, it is quite a shame as well, because during the actual conference, it looked like it's actually going to be achieved. People were really uh, excited to see what would happen between the two nations, but it was just such a letdown. We hear that Kim Jong-un wanted to lift all these sanctions just just so that they would denuclearize, which it feels yeah. so unbalanced compared to what you'd really expect North Korea to well, say. The Singapore conference basically led to like a very sort of iffy state of the ten I think where, I think um, it kind of gave uh, North Korea kind of like a misleading message in some cases. Yeah, yeah it kind of misled North Korea to actually off. what's gonna happen. Yeah. I think- I think um, it's important not to underestimate. Like, I think a lot of people think North Korea's dumb. And- oh yeah, no, they're underestimating it because we don't. But I, some, we don't even know what's happening inside the country at the time. I think. I suppose the, it. I think the people that run the country, whether it be Kim Jong Un or someone else, most likely someone else. Um, I think they have a smart strategy because the Singapore conference gains political favor in the world. People go, oh yeah, look, they want to do new, new denuclearization. Then they lift off some of the sanctions that improves North Korea's lifestyle, which is what they want. Otherwise, because they're they'll yeah. be fearing a popular uprising, although they can't really uprise because they're freaking starving, which is you know a well, story for another time. But like, there's also mm, there's also been reports of uh, Kim going to go to Moscow as well. 
Yeah, so this is also kind of uh, creating a bit of problem or tension between America oh. and Russia. A, l a little aside, I wonder if he'll fly there or I wonder if he'll take his train. <laughs> Just in clip as well, having a smoke break, and like with it, he his uh, sister has a gold, like a diamond cra uh, crusted um, cigarette oh, no, <laughs> cigarette God. bowl. Are you serious? The ash, the ashtray, yeah. Is... And like she she walks up to him and like and Kim will just do you know a little tap tap, little dust, little, little ashes off. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just so horrific. Like considering how dire the situation is career and then uh, we got this this man over here just tapping his little ashes off. I don't know. Going I feel like if tapping we take it this... fast and he's about to tap the nuclear button. <laughs> yeah, I think if I take this from a North Korean perspective, I'd say that was a bit of an oversight. Like, they should have played it a bit smarter. They shouldn't have demanded the full. The thing is, we know of... they said they were gonna take only part, of, right? They said the North Koreans yeah. said they're only asking for partial removal. No, they, they want. They want. They wanted four. They wanted a full removal of all sanctions. They declared. And that's why Trump left. Yeah, and that's why they oh, they yeah. couldn't agree with it because they, it was an impossible task and it just was not balanced. If that's yeah. the case, then the North Koreans definitely thought that they had, you know, gained they thought that they could points. do it because they thought like denuclearization would be a big impact. If if it's that big to the uh, outside world, then that means we can probably lift the sanctions. Can I just say that there's there's another there's another point of view that you could take on this, which is that um, the North Koreans didn't want the summit to go through, and they wanted it to end like that. I, you know what? I honestly, was, uh, if that was the case, though, they wouldn't even have a summit. True. But... No, 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 I can I can sort of see that because now they okay the summit ended things. People are now disappointed because they're like, oh, we were hyped up on wanting this to happen. Then they go back to building their nuclear site, yeah. and people get scared again. So then there's a hundred percent chance of another round of talks at some point, right? There's there's a guaranteed chance, and then, yeah. you know, I don't know. I think they probably have a grand strategy. Um, well, they're having talks strategy. with Russia soon, so... I think, I think they do have a grand there. strategy in mind. But, but, but what's the point grand. of all of this? Because if that's the case, or North Korea, if North Korea's going to do all this, or China's going to say no, and the entire thing's going to collapse. Exactly. I mean, the North Korea might have we... weeks, but China has, like, quite a hard grip over Kim Jong-un. And if Kim Jong-un would could do all that thing, then he could he could do it without Xi Jinping, at least just turning oh, he a blind needs, eye. He needs China. Yeah, without yeah. China, his country is useless. Besides, as well, like, politically, North Korea is just doesn't have a good political leader at all. Kim Jong-un has no clue what he's doing. That's, out that's why I sort of think there's people pulling the strings, because... With, it has to either be summit, people pulling the strings, but it has to be approved by him. Well, we but, have we no, can't. Like it's just more like a rubber snapping thing, like China's um, uh, parliament, whatever they're called. Yeah. Yeah. People's assembly. Yeah, um, you, I, actually, one thing I find amusing. If you look at the way Kim Jong Un's being treated, it it, yeah. it could be something like a Hirohito situation, where he has the power to do whatever he wants, but he just never uses it. Yeah, yeah. Controlled by the military. Yeah. Except there's no civilian government. <laughs> like there was in Japan. Well, Japan. Well, the oh, yeah, that's true. There's no civilian government in North Korea. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um. Yeah, do you want to. I think, guess we can probably move on to the. Um... Sean, you want to kick us off? Alright, so we'll start off with the main topic, which is the topic of German unification. So, as we know. Germany unified in 1871 and was yeah. a short-lived empire until 1918, sadly. And we would like to discuss about how Germany itself came to power. So first, yeah. we'll talk about the uh, main con or the main start of unification, or what led to people wanting unification. So uh, we'll start off with the collapse of the Holy Roman Empire. So as we know, uh, you okay, Peter? Yeah. It's just okay. Cool. Um, that, was, that, was a, that was a bit of a that was a bit of a scared ooh. But um, so we'll start off with the class of the Holy Roman Empire. So as we know, uh, during the reign of Napoleon, uh, to, in his invasion of Europe, he uh, took over the Holy Roman Empire, especially Austria, and forced the uh, Holy Roman Empire to dissolve as a whole, leaving the whole state of the Holy Roman Empire as just multiple independent nations as well as annexing the Rhine. 
all that those areas. Yeah. Uh, eventually, after Napoleon's collapse, there was no uh, the whole Roman Empire was gone at this point, and instead the Austrians, Prussians, and all the minor German states reformed the uh, Roman Empire as a new confederation, the German Confederation, founded in eighteen fifteen as a replacement. So it would act in a similar function, uh, basically a political confederacy between the German states, in which policies and decisions were to be made between each other. The confederation was halted, though, in 1848 during the year of revolutions, where revolutions were spreading across all of Europe. Uh, in this time, the German Empire, the, a small German Empire was created from 1848 to 1851, where uh, the King of Prussia would be the emperor. And this would be called the Erfurt Union, which was a really short lasted empire. Uh, the Erfurt Union wanted to be pushed for real uh, German unification, though, uh, pushed by the Prussian government, unfortunately, due to Austrian intervention. Uh, this was not possible. Yeah. So, so let's start at the top with the, uh, the Napoleonic invasion of yes. you know, Germany. Um, I think it's really important to not understate the effect that Napoleon had. Oh, over yes. Germany. France oh, was oh. a deciding factor, not even just now, but even later. Oh yeah, it, France was... Because the, the problem with Germany and France is the German states always had a rivalry between France because France was the biggest yeah. factor preventing German unification. Exactly, yeah. Because yeah. France is always afraid of if Germany were to unify, there would be another powerhouse in Europe that could rival them. Yeah. Mm. Well, with, with the... um. The, the French invasions, and after the HRE, the Holy Roman Empire was dissolved, um, the French decided to just sort of form something called the Confederation of the Rhine. Yes. Um, which is sort of like a satellite, but it started off as a confederacy of actual like supporters for Napoleon, but as the war goes on, Napoleon doesn't take more independent control. And the, um, the Confederation of the Rhine, I believe, actually started off the whole process of German unification, because with the introduction of the French models of the rule of law and the abolishment of the um, the feudal system. It did a lot to improve the um, the way the German thought in terms of politics, moving it from a more of a feudal society under Emperor Francis II in the Holy Roman Empire, moving yeah, it I'd... forward into a greater um, state made up of more more modern politicians and the rule of law as a whole. Well, at this time as well, the Holy Roman Empire was just collapsing on itself because it was it was heavily reliant on single state ruling over this whole large empire it wasn't a single country it was more or less just one person ruling over multi, like just s small amounts yeah. of people it just didn't work out properly and people were just not favoring the holy roman empire anymore. so with its collapse it wasn't too bad of a thing uh because like with the Stat the status of the German Confederation and actually gave uh, the German states more rights rather than it being led by just Austria. People Wasn't are still it, yeah. afraid of Austria though. Wasn't okay. the German Confederation like sort of dominated by Austria though? It was dominated by Austria, yeah. but it gave more rights to the in independent German states yeah. because in the Holy Roman Empire, it was Austria was the emperor of all of them. Yeah. Everything would be followed by Francis them. II. But in the Confederation, there would be votes and all that. It was basically yeah, like yeah, a democracy yeah. in this. They had a parliament. Or whatever yeah, they had a they had a proper parliament. They had a they had a diet of the that the German Confederation. Yeah. Is yes, the diet. Almost, the diet almost. was the, basically the biggest part of the German Confederation, yeah. where the main German states and yeah. their delegates would meet. Could together. we say it would be more comparable to like the EU? Uh, it's similar. It's not not the EU. It's like kind of a UN well, between actually, German states. Oh yeah, that's terrible. yeah. It's it's it's, it's like a UN um, of German states. Except, except there's a little bit more power than that. Yeah. Like, and there's a parliament. There's a like, oh yeah, well it's basically a parliament in most cases. But uh, it yeah, laid the foundations for German unification. It, it was the basically yeah, it was the foundation of German unification and also just enabled for the Germans to discuss their internal problems and. Yeah. Uh, right. I mean, the so, defeat of the HRE could also be seen as a wake-up call, like a slap oh, in the face. The German yeah, states telling them to reform now, or else they're gonna die. Well, it, it really wasn't that, actually. It was more or less the revolution of 1848. That was the big wake up call because people all across Germany were pushing for unification, especially in Prussia. Uh, they oh, yeah. desired for unification. Um, they wanted to pass the Erfurt Union. And there, it almost, it was a short lasting thing, except, or well, empire, except it was undermined because of Austrian pressure. 
the Austrians didn't yeah. want an Erfurt Union. Unless it would be under Austrian control, but this would be under yeah. Russian control. Yeah. So that was the biggest. Alright. Um, the next, the next main thing. Well, we'll start um, talking about uh, Bismarck's role into German unification. So we know Bismarck is the uh, chancellor, or I think this, at the time he's called the minister president of the Prussian government. Yeah. Uh, he wanted to push for German unification after, um, because of the uh, small uh, empire that lived in uh, 1850, uh, 1848, 1851, uh, the Prussian king at that time, uh, Frederick IV, desired yeah. to unite Germany as well. He wasn't too for it, but he wanted to do what his people wanted. Actually, wait, yeah. can I put in there? Um, I read something that Bismarck wasn't at first for unification, it was only that because his monarch was Oh no, he wasn't, that's right. That, Actually, yeah, he, then, he, he was a, he was a Prussian reason, nationalist. He, no, 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 he, yeah, he was exactly. a nationalist, but um, he wasn't completely for unification as well, because when Bismarck technically Bismarck wasn't actually brought into power as, as the king's first choice. He was the last choice. Bismarck yeah. only got into power due to other candidates just not wanting to become the president minister of the Prussian yeah. government. Eventually, the king uh, called Bismarck from Russia to become the new minister president. Yeah. So, again, back to, to what we were saying that. before. Well, back to what we were saying. Uh, with the Frederick Wilhelm IV uh, having a stroke, now his brother would take control. We would know that. Wilhelm I, the first emperor of Germany, uh, he wasn't as keen on unification at first, but he eventually started to grow a grasp towards it. And eventually he would hire Bismarck to be the minister president. Bismarck, his uh, use of political strength and all his concept of real politic and blood and iron, yeah. basically helped to. Um, Unified Germany, as we would see uh, with his utilization of political incidents that would happen, and he would be, be able to grasp on these incidents to help the Russian advantage. So, the, one of the examples would be the Second Slesvig War. So, after the First Slesvig War in 14, uh, 1848, sorry, uh, because due to a fear of international intervention, the Prussians lost, uh, the, sec the Second Slesvig War was fought uh, between Denmark and Prussia once again uh, due to the Danish king having uh, passed away. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, there's always a there's always a yeah, oh, yeah. there was a succession crisis between two uh, house or two parts of the German the Dutch house. Uh, I'm sorry, Dutch Danish. House, the Danish? I mean, da sorry, Danish, Danish, the Danish house. Uh, there was one side that was favoring the Danish, and there was one side favoring the Germans. Yeah, and so yeah. the Danish side won eventually, and because... the new king wanted to completely assimilate. Uh, Schleswig Holstein uh, into well, the German um, country. Yeah, wait, I should point out that uh, was a more of a autonomous region, and um, it was I yeah, it was a, uh, Holstein was a part of the German Confederation. Yeah. Right? yeah, it was it was a part of the the actual German Confederation, but the problem is that the Danes wanted to assimilate the whole area as part of yeah, Denmark yeah. completely, yeah. because at at this point it wasn't officially part of Denmark; it was under the throne. It was exactly. a state of it was a state, but it wasn't part of Denmark. Okay. Is an autonomous region. Uh, this is like a first. This is like a good first example of German national. The German mm. people, that being the Confederation, oh, wanted yeah, to be, think... wanted to stop the um, removal of German people from a Ger the German Confederation, that being mm. also corporate Denmark and oh yeah. The so, Danes, the Danes were ruthless with assimilating Holstein. What they wanted, the, what they were doing was they wanted they forced uh, the German citizens in Holstein to speak Danish at. To forget the first language and to learn Danish, they would they banned the speaking of German in Holstein, which was a very very big uh, problem. As well, the factor that uh, Denmark was annexing, assimilating Holstein was also breaking a treaty that was set up between the Prussians yeah, and the Danes. Yeah, yeah. This helped them oh, to yeah. be able to justify the war against the Danes. And um, as we know, eventually the, Austrian... the king, eventually Sorry. the king gave up. The king gave up after the war. I think, um, oh yeah. Well, the, the problem is. Duchies, and, no, no, no. Um, after the war, well, the war was fought between Austria and Prussia against the Danes. Yeah. Yeah. Because Austria, Austria as well, wanted to release the German states, and also Prussia convinced them. 
Yeah. And so with that, the Prussian army dominated the Danish because the Danes at this time were very proud of themselves after winning against the Prussians in the first session. Um, they they remembered themselves to be the victors and they were very prideful. Except, unfortunately, that pride uh, would come to bite them. Qu quickly shattered after the combined. Oh yeah, it quickly Austria shattered and, and Russia just steamrolled through. Yeah, and so with that. Uh, the Second Sussex yeah. War was won in the Prussians' favor, especially, I think, the most... Not, not exactly. Battle. Wasn't the two territories split? Oh, it the was It was split. Yeah, Holstein yeah. became a... Schleswig, yeah, yeah. Schleswig, Schleswig was Prussian, Basically, Holstein Prussian would be satellite. Austrian. Well, yeah. they, wasn't actually, they were both, they they were both uh, technically yeah. satellites-ish. They were, they were like, occupied regions for us. Yeah. No, what, the, the thing was, they were, at the Confederation of Deer, they were given administrating control of the regions, but technically yeah. they weren't a part of Austria or Prussia. No, they and were not They were not official parts of it, but they were monitored over by them. This thing was a result of the Gaston Convention, which led to the, um, well, the next key part in uh, The Austro-Prussian War. Yes, yeah, exactly. Right. So, with the problem of Schleswig and Holstein being two kind of independent nations, the Prussian, uh, there was a meeting in the German Confederation where Diet was held, uh, kind of to discuss the Prussian occupation over Schleswig and also the Austrian occupation of Holstein. So, the Austrians favored that Holstein and Schleswig would be autonomous states or under Austria, I can't remember exactly. Uh, well, I mean, I didn't wait. It was really something, it was, it was along those lines, and Prussia was very against the stating that Schleswig would. Schleswig and Holstein should belong to Prussia as they bordered the nation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the Diet, though, the Diet of German nations all favored, well, majority favored Austria due to the fear of Austrian uh, intervention. Yeah, they had, in the case. They had dominance. Yeah. And also, exactly. Austria was a dominant Austria, nation as they were this massive nation, including Hungary, Czech, uh, Bohemia. I mean, at Lower this Balkans. point, um, Bismarck was starting to show his cards and how he's sort of a very expansionist. Yes, this, and he also showed that. By like, this how, time, the German nationalists weren't. As strong as they would be, you know, five years later, which in this case, a lot of the states really didn't want to be annexed into Prussia. They oh were no, they really the, afraid this... that they were going to get annexed into Prussia. Oh yeah, but the, uh, some German states in the Diet actually favored case way because they were kind of just tired of Austria constantly dominating the politics of the Confederacy. Um, but yeah, as we were saying, the Diet favored Austria, and with that. The Prussian delegate read out to the Diet, stating that this would be a declaration of war, where Prussia well, would actually, go against. I should mention before you say that um, it was actually Prussia that acted unlawfully because they were the. I'm sorry, not they were the ones that actually broke the convention by. Um, oh yes, and that, that, that which uh, sort of gave Bismarck a reason for war. Um, I can't remember specifically. I'll have to look at it on the. Yeah, but, yeah. Well, yeah. Basically, was, they read out. There's also the fact that um, the Prussians declared the Confederacy to be illegal. Uh, no, the they, didn't, right? they didn't declare it illegal, but what they did was after they stated that they would declare war and that they declared the Confederacy uh, what's the word? obsolete. Oh yeah, obsolete. That's yeah, right. they basically dissolved, they, yeah, sorry. In this, they declared that the diet was invalid and the, and the German Confederation dissolved and declared war against the Austrians and the southern German states because at this time the Austrians were allied to the southern German states. Um, I mean, at this it, point, the, if you look at the war, it, it's really important to also kind of look at what's been going on with Austria and Prussia. Oh, Although so Austria still had a lot of political influence over um, Germany, the, its economy actually was doing extremely poorly. I mean, by the time it's 1866, Austria almost went bankrupt. Oh um, yeah. Some of which was Austria. due to the, the Prussian cus customs union, was it? Because mm. the the Prussians decided to form a custom union, like a free trade agreement, a sort of economic cooperative entity between mm. all of the German states and Austria. Basically, got isolated and thrown well, out. Well, most most of the German trade was basically in the northern area as well. Yeah. Basically, that's what most of the German economy was focused. Um, so back towards the Austro-Prussian War itself. So, so Prussia and some of the northern German states would go to, and Italy would go to war against the uh, Austrians and the yeah, southern the German states. Sorry, I had a little brain fart there. Uh, so the Austro-Prussian War would last seven weeks and was a quick war due to the uh, introduction of the German 
uh, the rifles? military command. Well, basically, oh, yeah. the first, it was technically yeah. the first ever um, military cabinet. Yes. Well, official military cabinet, and with the introduction of the new general, Helmut von Mock, the older, uh, Austria was able to lead a decisive war. Uh, so von Mock, he was a very, very famous general who used new forms of tactics uh, to help win against the Austrians using a lightning war. In this case, similar to a blitzkrieg, except oh, yes, without um, all the vehicles. Yes. Uh, it was more or less just sending all the troops as fast as possible to the other side. Uh, he he utilized. Uh, Air, things such as the uh, trains and railroads mm -hmm. they mobilize troops yeah, faster yeah. as well the introduction of new weapons um, such as the needle gun which was the first ever oh, yeah. um, breech loaded rifle needle gun. yes the breech loaded rifle like, so this was it did really underestimate rifle. just how much like the fact that the Prussians were so militarily advanced and, like, they were they were as most people state Aust Prussia, or as most nations are a state with an army, Prussia is an <laughs> army with a state. What a, it's such a good yeah. Prussia was the military of Ge of the German area. They were a completely yeah. military dominant nation. It's kind of yeah. interesting because Austria would have tried to pursue if they were. To, I don't. I don't know if they were completely to pursue like unification, but I think with obviously to pursue influence, they wanted to sort of do a semi unification through influence and diplomacy, whereas Prussia mm. was willing to and able to, to be perfectly honest, um, as well as, as shown in the Austro-Prussian War, they were, yeah, they were willing and able to do it by yes. force. Like, as, well, they, the they thing is, Austria, Austria is the diplomat of Germany, Ru yeah, exactly. uh, Prussia is the army of Germany, that's the thing. Austria is one Because, like, as, the thing is, the sword is better than the pen, in this case. In some cases. Yes, in most cases, well, in this case, yes. the pen is better than the sword, but in this case, the sword is better than the pen. Yeah, because in this case, Prussia can just assert their demands with force rather than yeah. just through diplomacy. Mm. Uh, so as we finish, um, well, the Austro-Prussian War would turn in the favor of Prussia, especially during the Battle of Königgrätz, where the large, yeah. large Austrian army with two hundred thousand and fifteen Austrians and twenty-three thousand Saxons would fight against two hundred thousand Prussians. Uh, somewhat outnumbering the Prussians, as well as the Prussian ar not all the Prussian armies were able to reach there. Uh, the Prussians were able to decisively defeat the uh, Austrian armies due to yeah. the new forms of technology, especially the needle gun, which uh, enabled them to reload while laying down, taking cover. I should mention one thing about this: um, the battle, um, the result of it, uh, Bismarck just pursued peace straight after that. Right, he didn't do what the Prussian military wanted to do, which was continue fighting. And the fact mm. that he didn't do that meant that he, they weren't seen as too much of an aggressor. Like, you know, um, because otherwise foreign influences, i.e. France, would have seen, oh, like, oh no, Prussia's getting too big, they're, they're winning well, this war. The, thing is, yeah. the biggest thing was um, after the actual battle, or actual after the war itself, the king demanded that, the king demanded to Bismarck that he wanted pieces of Austria. Yes. And this yeah, one replied yeah. to him saying, no, we can't do that. We can't take Instead, any they land. Went, but they still took a crap ton of land from um, central Germany. They took like... Yeah. Um, oh no, no. That, wasn't, that wasn't through the peace deal itself. That was through Basically. the like, ultimatum they issued. Yeah, it was an ultimatum to the northern German state Those, saying... Yeah. Those because who voted after, with because Austria, after the yeah. Austro-Prussian War, they got rid of the German Confederation completely. Yeah. And then so did the Northern German Confederation, where uh, those yeah. Northern German states would either could be either annexed into Prussia, or would yeah. be able, would take a, a form of Prussian power. Yeah, I should wait. Prussian, I should Prussian emphasize that. Um, I should emphasize at the what is it at the beginning of the war. Bismarck and well, Prussia essentially issued an ultimatum to the Germans, saying that anyone that Prussia would would um, destroy any nation that yeah, voted with Austria. Know. Yeah. And that is essentially, if, if they hadn't done that, if you're not with unification us, wouldn't, unification wouldn't have been achieved so, um, as, as far oh, as... Yeah, as because, it yes. It, it, in rather and, and in it also diplomacy, this problems. force, it shows, like, force is better use than diplomacy because it just entitles that you must join us or we will destroy you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, like, they, the, the utilization of the army was complete, or one of the biggest factors of unification as well. So... As we finish, uh, after the Austro-Prussian War, the German Confederation was dissolved and the North German Confederation was asserted. Um, with 
Prussia would annex small areas in North Germany uh, through the Confederation or through a treaty after the uh, Austro-Prussian War. As well, uh, small the nations of North East Germany would uh, join Prussia in the North German Confederations. Uh, these German well, states would uh, kind of well, sign a defensive pact with Prussia and the other states. As well, they would adopt the Prussian federal state as their new form of government. Yes. So yes. the thing, the key thing about the North German Confederation is that it basically, technically, although th there were minor nations in the Northern German Confederation, it was basically one country at this point. Yeah, it was just yeah. Prussia. It, it, it was mainly country. just Prussia and just these small minor nations, which technically is just Prussia at this point, because those nations yeah, yeah. must always follow Prussia because yeah. the and Prussian government is the main one theory. and they rule over it. Yeah. I should say the North German Confederation as was sort of the key spot where you could um, you could tell that it, it sort of tips the scales in Prussia's favor for unification as opposed to oh yeah it does Austria. yeah and the North well, German at Confederation this, at this point Austria yeah. had could not do anything with Germans now because there was no German Confederation they had no yeah, power anymore in the German region they, all they could do was focus on yeah. the Balkans at this point but the um, they, they were also part of Austria to an extent I should say. They didn't really support, I mean, they, they supported Austria as much as they could, but at this point, Austria was so just practically useless. Um, they, the, the southern states basically distrusted the Prussians, because for obvious reasons, they didn't want to get annexed. They distrusted oh, yeah. the French, because they feared the French were going to come and annex them. Um, they couldn't really get that much help with the Austrians, because A, the Austrians were going bankrupt, and B, um, there were still a lot of cultural issues in the, um, the Austrian Empire. So that well, Aust yeah, like, Austria was um, having its own internal issues point as well as the signing of a treaty which established Hungary to assert over power over a few of the states not to assert power over the other states yeah which kind of yeah. at this point because Austria was having a form of revolution inside a nation yeah it was basically just causing it to collapse on itself yet uh, other than that basically Austria, Austria kind of pulled itself out of the German sphere yeah. to deal with its own problems I mean, for a while, yeah, they had the empire outside of Germany as well, which made Yeah, it exactly. The empire was outside of Germany, while Prussia's is, was basically internally Germany and yeah. a bit outside. I mean, for, for, for if we look at what's been going on for like 20, 30 years before this war, Austria has been slowly stagnating and declining. It, its political power, although still strong, its actual physical power from economic standpoint, it was yeah. act, it was actually been constantly diminishing, and meanwhile. Sex do a lot of reforms, um, you know, the Frankfurt Parliament, and after the 1848 revolutions, Prussia has been really getting stronger, but do you think Austria really realized this? No, because uh, Austria, the thing Austria had was that it relied on a factor of basically threats. It didn't, it didn't do yeah. anything physically, it, it was dip diplomatic completely. So with the factor that uh, Prussia was getting stronger, they always thought themselves Oh, people are always scared of us because we're massive. They yeah. can't. They can't do anything about us because we're this empire, and they're only this small area of German land. Yeah. But yeah, because really. they've never, they've never. Uh, well, they they fought with the Prussians, but they always saw themselves as being the reason why they won like the Sushri, the the second Sushri War. So. Basically, they never. They, they were too full of themselves to see what was actually happening this time. I mean, there's also the point where Austria has really only been. You exerting to power through the German Confederation. It was really oh, yeah. the they, they always thought that they could just assert power through that and that would be done. They would Yeah. And the country itself is just mixed cultures, so there's no actual like unification between them. So like in the army itself it's just a mixed races. There's no uh, single uh, culture that would help dominate over and kind of get a sense of unification or unity. Right, and then the Prussians at this time, I where mean, they were all, everyone was German. They had this sense of unification. Which, to add on to your point regarding the, the different cultures and sort of how German confederations like this loose batch of, you know, like a mm. batch of loose sense of the individual states, and the Austrians for a long time, even longer than the Prussians, wanted to keep the status quo, even though by 1848 it was pretty much, you know, almost impossible. Even after 1848, they decided to revive the German Confederation and sort of continue on with um, Metternich's policies. Uh, Metternich was the, um, the 
the Austrian Chancellor, I think, until 1848, of just sort of just keeping Austria in power through the German Confederation, even though the times for that sort of entity has slowly waned away, lowering yeah. you know, his defenses. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I think we should move on to the almost the final topic. So we'll go now to the Franco-Prussian War, which is basically the deciding factor resulted of, in yeah resulted in German Germany properly unifying. So yeah. at the end of the eighty of the eighteen sixties, the Spanish uh, kingdom threw out their monarch. Uh, yeah. Now, as every yeah. monarch, or as every kingdom has when their king dies, there's always a race to the throne. Queen, Bismarck, Isabella II. The, yeah, queen, sorry, queen. the queen, yes, yeah, so the queen. Uh, Bismarck just wanted to put Leopold uh, of Hohenzollern and Sigma in, yeah. in, on the throne, a relative yeah. of Wilhelm I, except at this time, he had not informed Wilhelm at all, or most of the um, Prussian yeah. policy, uh, Prussian parliament. Uh, eventually, Wilhelm discovered this through uh, the problem that happened in Spain, where there was a misread of the uh, of the st- of the of date the note, of a date. Yes, the yeah. date that was sent to uh, Spain, where parliament. Leopold arrived in Spain, and no one was there to congratulate him. Yeah. That was because he arrived a day late. The day before, the pol- uh, the Spanish parliament awaited him but he never arrived thus they declared that it never happened <laughs> this made headline news as the uh, french found this out and through that this um wilhelm the first found this out now wilhelm was furious at bismarck stating that this should not have happened you did not get to make these decisions and you he know didn't want, he french didn't want leopold also... on the throne because he feared the french would intervene and yeah. napoleon and bismarck, the bismarck yeah, agreed to this and with that uh, they pulled leopold's candidacy from the throne away on the other hand, though, the French saw this as a um, well problem and issued a diplomat to Prussia stating that uh, you must pull the candidacy of Leopold away from the throne, and Prussia did, and you must also state that not a single Hohenzollern should ascend to the Spanish throne. Now, Wilhelm took offense to this quote and argued with the diplomat stating that I cannot assure this. I will take away the candidacy throne, but I will never assure that a Hohenzollern will never be on the yeah. Spanish throne. And so, with that, Bismarck was able to kind of utilize this incident through omitting some words, basically yeah, paraphrasing yeah, what actually strong. happened, uh, in stating to the German or uh, well, the North German Confederation that the French delegates sent an insult towards our, our king. But on the yeah. French side, it was seen as the complete opposite. Now, yeah. both states were basically <laughs> up in arms, about to declare war on each other. And this this you... is just like a key point. Um, yes. It just shows how brilliant like Bismarck, Bismarck was. Bismarck was able to just, positions. yeah, the, with the help he of the Ems dispatch, he was able to I just, mean, well, well, the Ems dispatch was basically the deciding factor of this declaring war. I mean, I mean, Eventually, got, the couple French with were just... Threat of Prussian influence into Spain as well. Oh, yeah. So with that, the uh, French would declare war as because at this time, uh, Napoleon III, the nephew of Napoleon the first who wanted to be just like his uncle one oh. was kind of ruling over this collapsing empire and he yeah. needed something to kind of help it rebuild and he thought a war with Prussia well, with the help of the Ems dispatch he thought a war with Prussia will help revive this empire and see its unity and thus he declared war also because yeah. uh, they were a bit angry of what happened in the Ems yeah. dispatch and Bismarck wanted the French to declare war as he that if Ru- Prussia were to declare war, well, yeah, exactly. They'd there would be a fear of inter- intervention as well. It and would be seen as the aggressor. Yeah. The 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 thing that um, the main thing that led to unification was the fact that the French did actually declare the war because it mm. it gave it, it gave the German Prussia. states a sense of unity against a common yeah. enemy. Yeah. yeah. And they they quickly forgot about the fact that Prussia was just basically being extremely aggress- aggressive. Aggressive. Yeah, and they forgot about that. They instead themselves. saw. We must defend our brothers. We must. Yeah, and we are yeah. all German. We have to fight for each other. Yes. Like that, yeah. like that was basically the main uh, key. Is that the the Franco-Prussian War gave Germany, the German states, a sense of unity because all the German states at this time, except Austria, were fighting as one. Yeah. They yes. fought as one army under the Prussian banner. Yeah. And basically, it helped them kind of create this sense of because uh, the, the the southern states were the only reason nationals. why they hadn't unified yet, and. Because the southern states were located right next to France, this put them in a prime position. Yeah, to well, the the reason why they weren't assimilated 
Federation was because of France. They fear that if they did, the French would be like, oh, cannot do that. I mean, there's yeah. also the fact that afterwards, baseball basically used his um his newfound position as the, the basically the leader who won the war to pressure the southern states to join him, where else they would be basically politically isolated. Well, it's not just that. Well, because all right, let's look at the franco prussian War itself. So the, yeah. the war itself would last a year, and the French. At this time, people would assume the French to be the dominant army because, as we know, France has been this massive yeah. powerhouse in Europe at this whole time. It had the larger army with millions of troops, while Prussia had only just under a million. I think. Uh, the Prussians, though, instead had more modern technology and, again, the use of trains to help mobilize the troops faster. So, as France would send these, uh, already had these large amounts of armies, Prussia was able to send more men at once. Through quick yeah. amounts of time, through train schedules. Uh, as well, the uh, Prussians abandoned the usage of lines of fire and said fought in smaller battalions and squadrons, which helped kind of reduce uh, casualties in battle. And they also favored the utilization of artillery as kind of closer to the front. Sorry, not closer to the front, uh, further from the front, kind of, to prevent them from being overrun by a cavalry. Yeah. As well, the use of the automatic kind of semi-automatic rifle was uh, yeah. utilized to kind of got rid of the uh, use of cavalry charges. And so yeah. uh, the, the Germans, the Prussians, or well, technically the Germans won multiple battles, but the most decisive was the Battle of Sedan, which is remembered as a German legacy. Uh, the Battle of Sedan resulted in the collapse of the French Empire as the Germans seized the area and defeated the French army there, and leading the French army was Napoleon III himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, Napoleon handed his sword and surrendered to the Prussians and the other German states. Um, with that, the French Empire was no more, and instead, the French had to establish a provisional government of defense, which was very illegitimate. No, no uh, French saw it as real. And uh -huh. The government supposedly said that they would not give an inch of land to the Prussians. This so kind of the war basically continued for their six months. It continued for six months because when you have the when you have the king as your prisoner, who do you send yeah. the peace to? Oh, and so true. they Paris this got kind of because originally they wanted to send a peace with the capture, but they couldn't because now it's a new provisional government. So yeah. with that, Bismarck told your boy Moltke, my dude. You can go into Paris, and he was very happy about that. No, didn't he they have siege it? Oh no! Yeah. They, yeah, they did. They they were able to go because they went from just being in Alsace, where basically the war was over. They went straight to Paris and just sieged the whole place down to assert their um, well, dominance and basically their authority. Yeah, their authority in the case. One, there's a very interesting story as well. There was one um, politician who rode in a hot air balloon and tried to go to the Loire from Paris to raise an army. I heard about that, yeah. It was being seized, yeah. And so, eventually, uh, Paris was sieged down. People were starving, people were killed in the bombardments, and it was basically kind of a violation of human rights. In the the, um, I mean, the provisional government tried to raise an army, but what they got was just an angry mob. No, they, they and... got an army. The thing is, they had an army. They took all the reserve forces from France and sent them all to Paris to defend. Yeah. The thing is, yeah. they thought, all right, they had a big army. But what happened yeah. was, oh, let's just encircle them and just do wait, let them die out, which really was the main winning decisive factor, which is starving the French out. If I if I remember correctly, they started they were starving the French, and then it was taking too long, so they decided to fire the artillery. Yeah, that's what happened. Yeah, and but the problem with the artillery was that it killed many civilians. Mm -hmm. Many civilians uh, resulted in multiple deaths and the kind of almost destruction of Paris. Um, so with that, the F Germans were able to assert their demands, stating uh, we want Alsace and Lorraine and a lot of money. But and the, the French, French and delegate the stated that if we give you all this, our country will be set up on fire and the revolution will burn. And with that, Bismarck said it's not a prompt that you start a revolution now before it gets worse. Mm -hmm. Yes, very, very cool Bismarck. Yeah, I and, like, you should see the re the, re the repercussions of the fact that they actually did that. Sort mm. of laid part of the foundations for the First World War. Because yeah. yeah, it was it, the main factor. It gave factor that was... French revanchism, and it 
he gave the French a reason to go back to war. Take vengeance for the Franco-Prussian wars. Yeah, basically collapsed the, the, the French the, country the again. Bitterness, the bitterness of the French lasted all the way until 1918, mm. where they were finally able to take the revenge of the Germans, and you know, in this, it just completely crush. Yeah, the Germans with reparations, which is what technically, I guess, what the Germans did to the French. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Now let's finish this off. So, with the French defeated, uh, well, at the end of the Franco-Prussian War, Bismarck enforced the French to recognize Wilhelm I as Kaiser. Uh, though also, it's only uh, meant German Emperor, not Emperor of Germans. Wilhelm yeah. I, though, desired the role of Emperor of Germans. Yes. So, Bismarck, though, informed him that the princes will not agree to this. You can only be German Emperor, not Emperor of Germans. Uh, with that, Wilhelm dismissed Bismarck for the day, stating they're not talking to him for the rest of the incident, for the rest of the day. Uh, but the problem was, Wilhelm could not decide uh, to be Emperor of Germans. It was relied depending on the Duke of Baden. Uh, he would decide whether the princes would agree to crowning Wilhelm as Emperor of Germany. And once they reached the Hall of Mirrors, uh, the Duke of Baden proclaimed all the German soldiers, all hail, Kaiser Wilhelm, Emperor of Germany. This single sentence united the German states as one under the German Empire, uniting all the southern yeah. states as one. <clears throat> and Germany came to be. Yes. And there is also yeah. a very nice painting of the whole mirrors. Oh, uh, yeah. Lifting the swords. It, 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 it's, it's also a, quite it, interesting. It's a, it's a beautiful picture as well because it is. If you go to uh, the German Historical Museum, there's the actual picture itself, the original one. Oh, it's, wow. cool. it's mass. It's basically the size of like four people, like high, yeah, like, like five people oh, long. My God. It's massive and it's beautiful because so it, it's, it's it's a very important part of the history. Of it's the official proclamation of Germany as an empire. Yes, and then and then World War I mean, happened. Technically, the real the the real proclamation was through Bismarck saying uh, going to the southern German states um, people or well, southern German kings such as Bavaria saying that you can join us as a nation and we'll pay for your castles, uh, Leopold, because Leopold the the Bavarian king was a very big guy of making these super fantasy like castles, which were very beautiful, I must say. And he appealed to the uh, other German states, but eventually the decision lasted with the Duke of Baden. And he was yeah. the main decider because he was the more de dominant factor of the southern states. Um, and that, my that friends, was... is the unification of Germany now. What I should mean, we there's also, there's also the, the little detail where the Penny didn't, the House of Mirrors, kind of make the French even more upset. Oh, the fact, the fact that they did it in France is just the, kind of yeah, like exactly. kicking the balls for them as well. Yeah. Oh. But yeah, it, every almost everything is done in Versailles nowadays. The, the, this was the first Treaty of Versailles. Technically, yeah, uh, the second uh, Treaty of Versailles, unfortunately, would be the Blight of Germany. Uh, yeah, that's so, true. Yes. So in 1871, Germany was proclaimed in the whole mirrors of Versailles uh, after the Treaty of Versailles. So Germany would yeah. go on to live, or Ger the German Empire would go on to live until 1918, lasting for. Almost forty years, and then World and then World War One was just like more than forty years. Um, uh, forty-seven years. Yes, forty-seven years. Um, a very short-lived empire, but one of the most dominant. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, the Thanks British were still pretty important, and like oh yes, the British were important, oh. but the the German Empire was an empire that was dominant inside Central Europe. So, yeah, Britain, Britain itself was a dominant power across like the oceans. Germany was a dominant power inside of like Europe yeah. itself. Because <laughs> well, you know, you just count France as well. They were pretty important. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, but at this point, France is just gone to crap. Yeah. France, I mean, after the after this, French the French are just trying to recover again because, yeah. well, as with yeah. every a, after every fallen monarch in France, a new republic is formed. Yeah, what are they on the fifth? Uh, now, they? They're on the fifth one now. Uh, they had two said, empires, uh, uh, two monarchies. So two, two times they were, went back to the monarchies. Two times they went to an empire. Five times they went to a republic. I mean, you know, we're still waiting on on the next monarch. 
Yeah, I can't wait for my next reboot of France. <laughs> the French re French rewind. Can I get my French re reboot? I hope they don't screw it up this time. I wonder if JJ Abrams gonna lead it next. Time. God damn it. <laughs> Okay, I think I think this conversation has reached beyond its pointlessness uh, point. We do you thank quickly... you all for uh, tuning in with us today. Uh, we do hope you have a great day, and this is uh... yeah. Good night. Good, good night. Good night. Uh, good this night. is real life history. Uh, signing off.